Hey, this is just a quick note about our sponsor, Pravado, the premier enterprise privacy platform, purpose-built to bridge the gap between privacy and engineering. Its privacy code scanning solution embeds privacy compliance and governance into the product development lifecycle and empowers privacy and security teams with unparalleled visibility of sensitive data flows and the insights to find and fix privacy vulnerabilities. You can leverage Provado's data flows, dynamic data mapping, privacy assessment automation, and real-time visibility of privacy issues. Enter the era of proactive privacy and transform privacy from business blocker to business enabler. To learn more, go to provado.ai. Hello, I am Deborah J. Farber. Welcome to the Shifting Privacy Left podcast, where we talk about embedding privacy by design and default into the engineering function to prevent privacy harms to humans and to prevent dystopia. Each week, we'll bring you unique discussions with global privacy technologists and innovators working at the bleeding edge of privacy research and emerging technologies, standards, business models, and ecosystems. Today, I'm delighted to welcome my next guest, Jason Kronk, president of the Institute of Operational Privacy Design and CEO of boutique privacy consulting firm, Enter Privacy Consulting Group. He's also the author of the seminal book, Strategic Privacy by Design. Previously, Jason worked as a technical consultant in Verizon's information security department and co-founded three companies. He's earned his JD with honors from Florida State University and his BS in mathematics and certificate of information systems management from the University of Rochester. I've known Jason for over a decade, and I'm delighted to have him here today to discuss what's new in privacy by design and default. And I'm actually sitting across from him for this special episode where we're recording live from my favorite annual privacy event, the Privacy Law Salon in Miami. Welcome, Jason. Deborah, thanks for having me. It's interesting uh, you reading my uh, CV like that. Some of those things I haven't heard in a while. I've been so focused on my more recent accomplishments, which you also mentioned, being president of the Institute, which we just uh, founded about two years ago, my Privacy by Design book, which has been in the works the last couple of years, and then my consulting, which has also been kind of my life the last couple of years. Yeah, excellent. Well, I'm really glad to unpack some things with you today. So, Jason, you state in your LinkedIn bio that your work at Enter Privacy Consulting Group focuses on helping companies overcome the socio-technical challenges of privacy. What do you mean by that? So, privacy is not just a technical concern. It's not just a legal concern. It's an organizational concern as well. So, it's about helping companies try to figure out how they interact with individuals, be they consumers, investors, employees. And again, that includes both uh, social systems and the way people work together and interact, like I said, in terms of of a business or organization and technical systems and the interaction between the two. It's a long-winded academic term, to say the least, but uh, definitely just trying to expand and say this is not just a technical subject and this is not just a legal topic. That makes a lot of sense because sometimes we couch stuff in terms of digital privacy. And this is like a good remember, a good way to me- remember that it's beyond the, just the digital. Yeah. So I talk about privacy in terms of interactions with mm-hmm. people. Either you're interacting directly with them as we are to here today, or you may be interacting with their data, which is kind of a proxy for them. And in doing so, you if you think about it, privacy that way, it's a much more expansive world. And you get into topics that are that are very on top of regulators' mind, like dark patterns and deceptive design, where you're trying to manipulate people and influence their decision making. And the kind of this data privacy thought is, is that a privacy issue? But it is, because again, it's about autonomy. It's about your personal decisions about how you want to interact with the world. Uh, and if we're trying to influence them or, 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 again, manipulate them, then that's a, a potential privacy problem. Yeah, that's it's one of uh, Dan Solov's uh, privacy harms, decisional interference, right? Yes, absolutely. Or, or if you were to take Woody Hardzog's uh, three pillars of privacy, uh, it's uh, autonomy. Right, 
these days I talk about privacy as being part of autonomy fairly often because we're, we're you know, there's a lot of conflation and I know I talk about this way too much in all of my episodes <laughs> so I'm not going to go into detail but there's a, definitely a market conflation of freedom of speech with privacy and I, I always use the example of how they're both under autonomy they're both part of like freedom but they're not the same thing yeah and if you think about you know kind of a lot of people for you know the past decade 20 years kind of a fundamental concern about Information privacy has been notice and choice. Now, notice and choice has has its problems, but the fundamental thing is about making sure people are making informed choices, mm -hmm. i.e. having autonomy over their data. So this all kind of stems from the same kind of underlying concept of how we as society interact with people and what authority we give them to make decisions about their interactions and what authority we take from them to make those decisions for them. Jason, I love your book, Strategic Privacy by Design, because it builds upon the great academic research of others to present a set of approaches, methodologies, and tactics based on use cases, risks to personal data, and the humans behind that data, uh, the privacy harms to be avoided, remediation techniques, et cetera. And I also know you just published the second edition of the book, and it's been out several years now. Can you tell us just a little bit more about the book generally, like the, the whole book, not just the update, and who your intended audience is, and then what has been added to this updated edition? Sure. Just know that there's going to be a quiz at the end of this podcast. So, <laughs> uh, no, seriously, I, I do run to a lot of people who they're like, oh, I've got your book. And I'm like, have you read it? And they're like, oh, it's my next book to read or, or mm -hmm. you know, and I'm like, well, there'll be a quiz. Let me know when you're done. <laughs> so, but uh, it, no, so the intended audience is really any broadly privacy professionals. I mean, it is billed as a textbook for the CIPT, but it is not necessarily a technical book. I get a lot of people commenting back to me that it was an easy read, that it was easy to digest. I use a lot of examples. So one of the things in my writing style that a lot of people have commented on is because I've been doing training on this topic for years, I've kind of reintegrated, like I've talked to people. It's like, here's this concept. And then I look in their eye and I see what they're getting and what they're not getting. And then I, for the next time, I re-envision that training so I can explain to people and, and help them understand the things that the previous mm -hmm. student didn't get. And that shows in my writing, as opposed to me just sitting down for the first time without having to try to ever explain this to people, writing what's in my head and being complicated for people. I'm using the same analogies and, and information to help people understand the concept, not just, again, just kind of laying it out. So the book lays out sort of the foundational concepts. And, and like you said, I leverage the work of other people mm -hmm. uh, judiciously and credit them uh, necessarily. I am not the inventor of many of these concepts, but I've just found that these things have been helpful. Dan Solov's Taxonomy of Privacy, the uh, Yapink Hopman Strategies and Tactics for Mitigation, FAIR, Factors Analysis of Information Risk for Doing Privacy Risk, the Future of Privacy Forums. Uh, I think it, it originally came from their harms of automated processing, but it, it, the harms are kind of widespread of any kind of, of, of privacy harms. Those are more of the, the tangible harms where Dan's are the moral harms. Mm -hmm. So uh, Lori Faith Craner's uh, Privacy Notice Design Space, uh, which is perfect as a, as a mitigation because Yapping Hopman's tactic is very high level. It's like you need to inform people. Well, then Lori goes into more of the how do you break wow. up informing people? Yeah. You know, you use these four different channels or modalities. And so it's, it's really fascinating. So now what's in the new book? A, a lot of people are like, well, do I need to get the new book if, if I've read the old one? There's about 30 percent more content. Uh, so there's, there's probably an extra 100 pages, actually. Some of it has been rewritten. I rewrote the threats and risk. Mm -hmm. I took the the kind of, even though FAIR is a quantitative risk, and I really want people to do the math, I recognize that most people don't like math. So I put that in an appendix and left the, the kind of descriptive chapter in play. I've gone more into detail in how to do threat analysis and mapping out and actually diagramming the threats in more detail. And again, this takes, this is from my work in consulting and my work in training. I've seen what works and seen what doesn't and, and kind of reintegrated that. It wasn't a one size fits all. I wrote it and then it's done. This is an evolving field and I'm, I'm looking to evolve it. One of the things I also did, I used to keep 
separate like Dan's uh, moral harms I called violations and then I called the tangible harms I called them harms now I call them harms one and harms two they're both types of harms I used to shy away from the term harm because lawyers tended to read that as kind of the the damages and harms you would find in a legal case I have also expanded on the examples. So each chapter has a set of exercises. It goes through an example of a particular app, and here's how you would apply it in real life. And then here are some exercises, and I have a whole chapter at the end with answers. Before I had question exercises in the book, now I actually provide model answers oh, nice. because I was, I was getting questions about that. And I wanted to show people not just what an answer is, but what is the quote-unquote model answer uh, from uh, the, the information. And then there is also like an append there's an appendix, which is a glossary, because being a lawyer, I use terms in very specific ways. And one of my major probably pet peeves in the industry and, and broadly is this kind of loosey-goosey talk we talk about. There are certain terms that people throw out. My biggest one is probably privacy risk and people kind of using that in a very loose way and not really understanding. Risk uh, to who? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There, and there's all sorts of like ways they're, they're kind of mismanaging that term. So I lay out in a glossary, here are the defined terms in this and specifically how I'm meaning them. And one thing, anybody who reads my book will realize I like a lot of categories. I put things in categories. I think it's easy for people to to put in their head. It seems to be the way people think is they have a section of their brain. And if they can put something in a category, it makes it easier for them to frame and, and go through. So we have categories of, of ta uh, the taxonomy of privacy harm. We have the factors of information risk. We have the strategies and tactics. And so it's all very categorical and it makes it easy to go through and diagnose potential privacy issues. Because again, I think a lot, what I run into a lot of training is people come up with these fantastical like privacy harm, but they're all muddled and they can't get it straight in their brain. And if you can't get it straight in your brain, you can't develop uh, mitigations. But if you can kind of silo and say, this is this very narrow specific harm, here is this very narrow specific mitigation we can do right against that particular harm, as opposed to having this very muddled concept and having this muddled uh, relationship uh, between that. And then muddled so, communication. And then muddled communication. Right. So it's all about developing <laughs> clarity of thought and, and kind of getting through this. So, okay, that was a long-winded response, but... Uh, but a great one, yeah. but a really good one. And I really look forward to reading the second edition. I know I have one coming my way. I have read the first one multiple times. I've got highlighter all over it. I've, I've, I've used it for my own analysis um, within organizations. Let, let me know when you read it, and I'll, I'll give you the quiz. Excellent. You just want to give quizzes, I I'm feeling. I <laughs> well, okay, so Jason, you've been part of several Privacy by Design frameworks that have recently been published. And I'd like for you to unpack the differences between some of them for our listeners. And the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, ISO Privacy by Design. The new ISO 31, I don't know how 700. to say 31700, so 31,700, I don't know how people say it. The standard for consumer goods and uh, privacy by design standard for consumer goods and services. It's taken about, what is it, five years now? Four years? Five years? Four years. Four yeah. years to develop this global standard. For those who are not familiar with the ISO standard process, for each country that participates in the international standards development process, a domestic standards body runs a technical advisory group of experts. In the U.S., that standards body is ANSI, and I just remember that the A stands for American. And American like National Standard. Standards Institute. There you go. And I was actually the vice chair of the U.S. TAG for this standard for the first two years, but then needed to step down due to some, a, a change in jobs. And so I have a lot of knowledge about how it started, but a lot less about how it's going. So, Jason, in your opinion, how's it going? Uh, well, well, Deborah, you and I are in the same boat. So I was only involved in the first year uh, as a subject matter expert, and then I ended up leaving. I personally got a little frustrated with the ISO process. It was one, it was very bureaucratic, which I understand, you know, when you're trying to coordinate you know, hundreds, dozens of countries and, and dozens of, you know, uh, stakeholders within each country. They have to have a very defined process. I get it. It was still frustrating. Then even within that, just the stakeholders that were providing input, I felt didn't have enough subject matter expertise in privacy or even more particularly in privacy by design. Now, 
I am not saying that my privacy by design process is the one and only way to do it. There are many ways to proverbially skin a cat, right? So, But it, it seemed like a lot of the people who were participating didn't have anything. They were kind of going at it without kind of the, the background knowledge. And then add to that kind of the bureaucracy and it was just frustrating experience. Now, I have not looked at the new standard. I have not publicized it as of this recording. Right. It's coming out in a week or two. I will get a copy of it. I have looked through the outline. And this was part of my concern before is that because you had to have consensus internationally, there seemed to be a Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hello, loyal listeners. The Shifting Privacy Left podcast is seeking sponsors who want to help educate our growing community of privacy engineers. Position your brand in front of privacy engineers, architects, developers, researchers, and privacy tech buyers. Insert a 30 to 60 second ad like this one into every published episode of the podcast. This is dynamic content after all. Feature your new product, an upcoming conference, a sponsored special deal, endless opportunities. Email sponsorship at shiftingprivacyleft.com for more information on our sponsorship package. Okay, let's get back to our engaging privacy conversation. Let me stop you there for a second. So the consensus part, each country had to come to consensus. So our United States tag would have to have a particular perspective that they're bringing to the international discussion. And so it was very much consensus building as opposed to what is the right thing and let's push that forward. Yeah. You had to have the political will. So, in each tag. Yeah. So, so going along with that, it was the, the problem I saw it was it was kind of like least common denominator. What is the least common thing that everybody can agree on at the international level to get past? So I think Again, haven't seen this final standard, but looking through the outline, uh, which they public, it seems to be very much a kind of same old, same old privacy governance issues, FIPS, fair information practices, and those sort of things. I reserve full judgment until I until mm-hmm. I read it. But again, I kind of go in with a, a little bit of a my eye askew, I guess. Or yeah, uh, I, I I guess I kind kind of in the same boat. I do remember we were beginning to frame the entire project as one, uh, how do you bring a product or service to market? So it didn't only include product development, also I think included like the marketing of it and, you know, all the way to retirement of mm-hmm. the product. So I do remember they're thinking that was pretty novel, but also thinking only people who pay the pretty expensive rate to get access to an ISO standard, it's not free and available to anyone. You would actually have to be a member of ISO in order to see it. And I'm wondering, do you know when it's published? I mean, will we be able to see it or only if you pay for it? Only if you pay. And that's interesting. So I I actually used to think, and I was disabused of this by one of the people from uh, who was involved, uh, Michelle Shiba from Canada, who was uh, the editor or, or, or some role. So it's apparently priced per page. Uh, that I didn't know. So you have to pay based on the, the number of pages that it is. I thought it was like a set rate for yeah. every standard, uh, but apparently not. So we'll, 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 it remains to be seen how much it is. Right. And maybe I won't buy it, uh, but I do yeah. have a underlying need to to want to see what it is. But um, yeah. Right. And then the uh, other thing I remember about it is, you know, I, I was thinking, oh, great, then there'll be a certification against that. And mm-hmm. this is a different process that, that through ISO. This is not like the uh, 27,001 and two where you can have a certification against, you know, the security. Yeah. So, so again, that's kind of the bureaucracy. Right. Mm-hmm. So ISO has this thing called a conformance standard. And so in order to put out something that an organization could conform to, it has to go through a special committee and special process and have certain terms in it. I, I, again, not really sure because this wasn't a conformance standard. This is, by the way, this is the only ISO standard I've been involved in working on. But that was something that we expressed early on. We were like, oh, we want it to be certifiable against. And they said, no, it have to go through another process. Now, apparently they could take it and go through that bureaucratic process and make it a conformance standard. But I think then it becomes, I I mean, this is purely speculation, but my understanding is, so you have some standard position, like you have to have X. Okay. Well, what does that mean for a company to have X? And so they develop like, what are the measurements and and effective controls you Mm -hmm. have to have in order to claim you do 
X, whatever that is. And I think that's what they would need is we would not only have to build like what the standard are, what are the, the 17 things you have to do, right. but for each one, we have to build how, how would a an assessor measure that and then how would they ensure that it was effective and all those sorts of things. So I think that's why this is not a conformance standard. Got it. So. And if we were even to bring it to the conformance standard level, I, my understanding is we it would have to go through another three to five year process. Yeah, and it's exactly. just like slowing Again, stuff down. Again, yeah. bureaucracy. So, and then the way I think this could be helpful, but besides an internal gut check and a framework for internally bringing our product to market in a privacy compliant way might be to require in your contracts with vendors and, and partners to you know, comply with this standard. So you could make it a standard you get others to comply with through contract, but it'll be interesting to see how much uptake the standard gets given that you have to pay to well, look at it and there's no real you know mechanisms to assure against it and yeah so yeah. so one of the one of the funny things uh when we were uh, involved in that, in that first year I was involved mm-hmm. some of the companies that were involved large, large name brand companies you know and I I spoke to some of the people and I'm like okay if, if this passes are you going to you know adhere to it and they were like no probably not and it's like okay so why are you involved are you in here, in, yeah. in in trying to get this you know uh, get your input into it so you yeah, I, I don't know what the market demand or, or impetus is, especially given, like you said, it's not going to be a conformance standard. Mm-hmm. So there's no uh, seal of approval that you can get from a third party that says you're, do, you're doing it. Yeah. Right. Okay. So let's now talk to something you do know a lot more about. I know that you're part of the team that created the nonprofit Institute of Operational Privacy by Design, or IOPD. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, the org's mission is to define and drive the adoption of privacy design standards to provide accountability and public recognition for good privacy practices. And then the website further states that the objectives of the IOPD are, one, to maintain standards for privacy design and risk assessment, two, hold organizations accountable through the certification mechanism, and three, educate and evangelize the standards. So tell us why the IOPD wanted to develop another privacy by design standard and <laughs> yeah. I guess I don't have to ask why don't you feel that ISO uh, 31700 <laughs> standard was sufficient. But, well, I, yeah. I mean, as a baseline, obviously, like we said, it's not a conformance standard, so right. it's, a, it's a it's a different animal. But there are so for a number of years, I have been kind of ruminating on this, and when I was involved in a lot of vendor negotiations. We would talk to vendors and you say, we'd say, what are you doing for security? And they would hand us their ISO 27001 certification. They would hand us our, their SOC 2, you know, whatever, CSA, Cloud Security Alliance uh, certification. So they, they would have something. And then we'd ask, well, what are you doing for privacy? And, you know, they would like go, Crickets. what? What's that? Yeah. They, or they would hand us their ISO 27001 and be like, here, look, we're, we're securing personal data. Yeah. And that's, that's what we're doing. So there really wasn't that. So, so I, I've been thinking about for years, like, it'd be nice if, from a business to business perspective, if I had the ability to say, give me your third party audit related to privacy so that I don't have to do it. And I know that somebody has looked at it and you're doing something right. It may not be, you know, perfect, but at least you're doing something beyond, you know, saying you're doing something. And then the second thing is I see a lot of companies that are out in the market saying we do privacy by design. Okay, what does that mean? Right. So so they may be doing something really well. They may be doing nothing really well. They may be completely marketing gimmick. Hey, we've got the world's best coffee. Right. (laughs) Uh, But, you know, we're doing privacy by design. So what does that mean? And so I think there was so I felt there was a need for kind of a gold standard around here. Now you can you have some process to follow so that you can say you're doing privacy by design. Now, there have been other privacy by design standards. Anne Kabukian has had something up in Canada related to her seven principles. But again, it's kind of more organizational prior. So another one we haven't talked about is IEEE came out with their 7002, which is privacy by design That's and right. products and services. Tell us a little um, bit about that one. Uh, so I did a comparison of it. And again, I think... From my perspective, I'm trying to create a sort of gold standard Mm -hmm. that holds company to a higher level. I think the IEEE, it's all right. But but again, it's kind of very watered down. It was based on consensus. They had a lot of people involved. And it just doesn't do enough from my perspective. We kept our standards committee rather small. 
and developed a, a tight standard. It still took us like a year. Uh, and then we accepted public comments and we we, we made some uh, adjustments based on the public comments. And it is, a, it is an evolving standard. We will we will continue to look at it. Ours is also, so this is different from say the, the ISO standard. Ours is the design process. So one of the things in researching and kind of deciding to establish this nonprofit was I was talking to companies and I'm like, well, what do you want? Do you want a certification for a product or service? Or do you want a certification for the business? And there was there was different answers. The answer was I don't know. Yeah, well, <laughs> large enterprises wanted their business processes certified that they were building their products with privacy uh, in, in mind. They didn't want to go through. They've got a hundred products. They don't want to have to certify every single product. Smaller companies with single products, single services, they wanted a seal of approval that says yes, our product has privacy built in. Mm -hmm. So that's why we are doing kind of a bifurcated standard. We're doing the standard for the design process, which is what we finished. And our next standard that we're going to work on is for the kind of the end product. So in theory, if you have a product development life cycle that is, has privacy built into the design process, and then you output an app, and then that app should then be able to meet the second standard, which would be for a particular app or service. Now, the main distinction there is the design process says that you have a risk model. You understand what the risks are. You have a level of tolerance that you adhere to with regard to, to privacy risk. But it doesn't specify what that tolerance has to be. So in theory, you could have a design process and say our tolerance is we tolerate everything. But as long as you're going through the ruminations of you have a risk model, you do risk assessment, you do trade-off analysis. Check the box compliance. Yeah, I, mean, I don't want to say that because there is some, some you know, there has to be that flexibility there. But but the end product may not meet everybody's definition of what privacy built in is. Mm -hmm. but, you, but you at least have the procedure in place to design privacy in. The end product is going to be a little bit more difficult because we want to set like what is that acceptable level? You know, you think of like underwriters laboratory and like uh, electrical devices, right? They set an amount of, you know, like an effective defective rate, right? And like 0.0% can be defective and, and deliver X amount of over and above electricity or something. I don't kind of make this stuff kind of not an area of expertise that I know, <laughs> but we want to define, okay, so, so, and this is the, this is a problem I run into with discussing privacy risks with privacy officer or companies all the time. So let's say you're a privacy officer of the company, Debra, and I come in and say, your product is going to result in 100 divorces a year. Is that an acceptable level of divorces? I would have to, <laughs> to look at a bunch of factors. I would not know based on that yeah, information yeah. alone. So a, right? lot of yeah. a lot of privacy officers say, when I'm like, no, no, zero divorces. That is not a reasonable response, right? If you were in the automobile industry and you said, I want to have zero deaths from my car, that's a great lofty goal. It's not going to happen unless you're not producing any cars, right? So you have to have some level of it. I mean, you can do things to make it safer, airbags, you know, speed limiter, seat belts, right. you know, all sorts of things to make it safer. But nobody in their right mind is going to say that the only real, that the only goal you can achieve is zero deaths out of your automobile. Otherwise, you're not going to be in the auto business. So you have to understand what a reasonable amount of risk is for your product. Again, if you're only selling 100 and you end up with 100 divorces, maybe that's a problem. Mm -hmm. But if you're Google and you're, you know, you have a, 3 billion customers, maybe 100 divorces isn't that bad. It's really, you know, in, in the grand scheme of schemes, it's, it's kind of, again, we have acceptable number of losses. We In any industry yeah. we do, we strive for better, but we can't, uh, we can't achieve uh, perfection. So we have to find where that dividing line is. And so for our end product, we have to figure out like, what is that acceptable level? So we don't have the problem of a company saying, yes, we build in privacy, but 100% of our clients result in divorces, right. and that's acceptable. It's a, just a different type of harm, right? Yeah. yeah. So so, but, so, then the question is, how are we going to build consensus mm -hmm. among our standards committee of what the acceptable loss yeah. rate or surveillance rate or harm that? rate? What did you do? Oh, no, no. We haven't gotten to that oh, yet. That's, okay. <laughs> that, that's, why we, that's why we put that off for the second standard, because we, we, we need to come up with that right. so that it's not open-ended. And so companies can't just make their make their own thing up. But we also have to be mindful of we we can't zero is not 
realistic sure. uh, of whatever measurement we are. Yeah. Yeah. I, I always used to kind of make the case for that whenever I would talk about security and people, you know, I'm like, the difference between security and privacy, uh, professionals behavior, right? Where I remember early when Facebook came to market, all the privacy experts went on to Facebook to understand the controls, to understand what's going on, mm-hmm. to understand the security people were like, just opting out. They're the type of person who's like, you know, they use tour and they use all of these, you know, <laughs> how can I minimize my, my, uh, exposure, exposure. Right. And so to me, the way I express the difference is like, you know, you, you don't just say like unplug from the internet because you don't want any risk. It's like to participate in society, you have to, you yeah, have yeah, to yeah. bear the risk to have a business. You must bear risk. That's right. just, just fact. Exactly. So, so interesting. Yeah. I, I think one of the topics you wanted to discuss is risk. And if, I don't know if we can transition, yeah. transition now. So uh, interestingly uh, enough. So if I were to tell you that now this is okay. So fair factors, analysis, information risk. They don't talk about like probability of something happening. They talk about frequency. So the understanding is this is going to happen a certain number of times mm-hmm. over a certain time period. Might be a year, might be 10 years, might be a hundred years. And maybe it's only once every hundred years, or maybe it's a thousand times mm-hmm. every year. But there's a frequency to whatever event. Now they're talking mostly about breaches and uh, cybersecurity incidents. But here's the thing that a lot of people don't realize, and that let's like say is there's a lot of people who are approaching privacy risk from a naive perspective within companies, uh, in, in naive in, in in a number of ways in terms of how they approach it. But let's let's say I were to say to you that. Our annual risk from whatever we're doing is a million dollars a year. What's your response? Is that good or bad or 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 what? Compared to what? Ah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So again, are you Google? Are you the U.S. federal government? You know, the Department of Defense, which has a three hundred billion dollar a year budget. Mm-hmm. You know, a million dollars is like chump change, right? But if you're a small business, then, you know, a million dollars can be a lot. So you have to be able to compare it against something. And that's the thing we don't really have from a privacy perspective is how do we compare is this good or bad? So like benchmarking generally? Yeah. And and so, so we don't have all of those. I tried and I've talked to a lot of people about like has anybody in the academic world done any research on like risk tolerance in the privacy space and there just isn't anything to be to be honest mm-hmm. i can't find you know anything where people have looked at at trying to figure out what what a good tolerance is it's a little bit easier in the cybersecurity world or in other things cuz we can equate things with dollars yeah but in privacy there are a lot of non-monetary harms that are that are not easily equatable. Now, some of them courts have tried, like if this results in your incarceration and you're incarcerated for 20 years, well, we look at, well, what was her earning potential over 20 years? And this is, so we'll pay her, you know, based on that, you know, earning potential. And so we can translate years in the dollar. Now, a lot of people would say, well, that's not a real good equation, but it's the best thing we kind of have to kind of remediate or provide for people. But again, if I were to say, we're in a hotel now, if somebody were to put a camera in your hotel room and you were watched for the three days you were at a conference, Mm -hmm. okay, privacy harm, right? Do I know about this or not? No. Okay. Yeah. Privacy harm. Privacy harm, (laughs) right? Well, and and that's what uh, Dan was talking about at one point, this kind of Consent has this magical property of turning a harm into a benefit. You know, if you're only if paying, compensated, it, yeah. It, well, no, if you're pay, if you're yeah. if you're paying for somebody at your house to say monitor your camera, right. you know, because you're a, a Alzheimer's patient or you're at risk of something, you know, then then it becomes a benefit, or you're getting re- paid for it or whatever. Versus if it's not consensual, you don't know about it, it, it's harmful. But point being is. So if you say your product is going to result in a hundred people being watched without their knowledge in their hotel room, what can you compare that to, right? right? So when we say a million dollars, people are like, oh, that's big numbers. Now, granted, maybe we have considerations is that big for Google or or, or DOD or something like that. But we we understand that that a million dollars is somewhat substantial for for you know most people. Most it's worth thinking about. Whereas if I said the risk of, of financial harm is ten dollars a year, it'd be like I mean almost everybody would be like yeah okay whatever. But if I say the risk is ten people being surveilled in their or monitored in their hotel room, how do you compare that? Yeah, is that good or bad or what? Yeah, so so we we just don't have the the language to talk about this yet. It's something we're still kind of like 
seeking through. And it's not even, I, I, I want to point point difference. So again, this is kind of one of the things that, that people don't think about. And I have to disabuse people of all the time is we're not talking about tangible consequences. So this isn't necessarily your emotional distress when you find out about it. It isn't the financial harm when somebody blackmails you. I mean, those are all certainly Separate considerations. Harms, yeah. This is just, you know, the moral harm of somebody monitoring you in your hotel room without your knowledge, right? right? And and we all would agree that it's a privacy violation, even though there's no tangible consequences mm -hmm. as a result. And the problem is, if you only focus, I, I've been in a couple of conversations, I have an IAPP blog post about this. If you only focus on the tangible consequences, then there are things you can do to minimize the tangible consequences that don't minimize the moral harm. I encrypt the camera in your room so you're less likely to find it with some sniffer and be upset that there's a camera. I decide, you know, as a policy, I decide not to sell it. So you're less likely to find out on the internet. I decide not to blackmail you. So you're not going to get blackmail you. I make it a pinhole camera so you're less likely to find it, right? So I've done all these things to reduce the tangible risk, the tangible harms, but I haven't done anything to reduce the moral harm of me, you know, watching you in the first place. Wow. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I will not be sleeping tonight. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's a really good point. And I haven't been thinking about that recently, but that's, um, and I haven't been, yeah, that is very, very helpful to keep in mind. And before we circle onto some hot topics in web privacy or more risk. Sorry, can okay, I, can I add, go back? Yeah, yeah, go yeah. let me just add one thing. So, so again, I don't have a way of setting tolerance, but what I do have a way of, of measuring how harmful that is. So what I've done in the past with companies is do surveys, right? So we put these vignettes, these uh, different scenarios out, and we say, binary, yes or no, do you think this is a privacy harm or not? And find out what people... So if I said to, to people, hey, a camera that you don't know about is monitoring you in your room, most people would probably say yes, it's a harm. Okay, a camera in a store, you know, watching people for theft... Is that a privacy harm? Most people, you know, we've gotten desensitized. We, we're, we're used to that. Probably say no. In a dressing room? Yes. I would what, say what, what, if, what if there's notice in the dressing room that there's a notice that, that you are being monitored for that? Because I have been in dressing rooms and stores that say that, right? So that's kind of more iffy. Right. But that's how we measure. So we say this is going to affect so many people. And if the majority of people say, yeah, not really a harm, then then it's probably a, a low severity, low mm. impact. Uh, so we're, we're able to, quote unquote, measure how harmful this is. If most people say, yeah, this is going to be very, you know, that that's egregious. Don't do that. Then if there's a chance of that, that's a, a potentially high harm. I've done surveys separately in the U.S. and the EU. And it's interesting, the, the dichotomy between the U.S. will say in, in certain circumstances, they'll say, yeah, that's not that's not that bad. And in the EU, they'll be like, yeah, that's horrible. Right. So this goes back to it's, it's also who in from a jurisdictional standpoint. So privacy risk is not this objective fact. It has this subjective interpretation related to your, you know, the people being affected. It's cultural. It's, uh, it's yeah. regional. It's very, yeah, absolutely agree with that. And before we move off the topic of risk, do you want to also tell us a little bit about the NIST privacy framework and the working group, the uh, privacy workforce working group? First, what is the NIST privacy framework? Why is it, was it developed and how is it helpful to yeah. global? So I, I think the relation there is, is a lot of people don't realize is the NIST privacy framework is a risk-based framework. Definitely risk-based. And and most people coming in from a checklist perspective, they're like, oh, it had all these things you have to do. But if you're doing it right, and a little side note, I'm actually working on a book on this. So I hope to publish a book on the, on using the NIST privacy framework. And I do training on this. I had some training last year, trying to develop some training. Uh, because again, I think a lot of people approach it very naively. And understandably, there's so much going on in privacy, it's hard to like get information. But if you really dive into it, there's a, there's a lot there. So the NIST privacy framework came uh, about uh, two years ago, and it was developed as a partner to the cybersecurity framework, which helped companies organize their business, organize their cybersecurity program, or in this case, their, their privacy program. And not necessarily, let me rephrase that, because, because this has been a contention recently within the discussion groups that you were talking about, the Privacy Workforce Working Group, is... It is not developed for your privacy program. It is developed for your organization 
to build in privacy because there are certain uh, what are called outcomes that may not be the purview of your privacy program, but they have to be done by the organization as a whole yeah. in, in order to help support privacy. Right. Dylan, who's one of the people from NIST heavily involved, and he said it really well, and I can't remember, he said something to the effect of, this is not for your privacy workforce, but this is for your workforce working on privacy. So again, kind of the broad workforce their tangential effects on the privacy program of the, of the thing, not just the privacy program uh, people working. Um, well, well, what's the purpose of the privacy workforce, workforce working, group? working group? Okay, uh, within so this is something they started last year. Again, it, it was done first in the cybersecurity world. The idea is you have these outcomes. There's 100 outcomes and you can, the, the, the NIST framework is flexible so you can add new outcomes or not. You don't have to subscribe to all of the outcomes, especially if you're a smaller organization. That's one thing that a, a lot of companies, they look at it and they're like, oh, this is too much. No, if you're a florist shop, you don't have to do everything. You have to pick and choose what's important to you. But the idea is you have this outcome, and then for the organization to accomplish that outcome, it has to uh, do tasks. So these tasks, knowledge, and skill statements. So your workforce has to go through and do these tasks. They have to have this knowledge to do that task, and they have to have these skills to accomplish this task. And one of the the, the good things about this is the idea is – if you're building a privacy program, you can go through and say, we want to achieve these outcomes. Well, here's all the tasks we have to do within our program. We need to hire people or, oh, yeah. or have people within our company who are doing these tasks. Here's the knowledge that we have to put on our job recs of the you know what knowledge they need to bring to the company or what skill set. Now, from a privacy training standpoint, this is where I really get interested, is I'm going to, once they're finished with this, align my training and say, here is the knowledge and skills that my training imparts so that you can do these tasks in a privacy program with it, you know, so that you can get these jobs in the future. Right, which is great. And because that to me is like, that's go to market messaging right there. You're meeting the needs of the market. And, 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 and this goes back to what I was saying earlier. I'm very categorical. I like having everything in a nice, neat little bucket. And so this helps me say, this training helps you with this knowledge or helps you learn this skill, which will help you accomplish this task, which, you know, will ultimately result in your organization achieving this outcome. I love it. I think yeah. that's great. Okay, so let's talk about some hot topics in web privacy right now. Um, in web privacy, yeah. okay. Yeah, there's first, a world. There's a world wide beyond the web. I've heard that. <laughs> uh, well, you know, more like kind of some of the interesting things going on. So first, don't ask me about global privacy control. Okay, well, it's more like a <laughs> not specific. So okay. like, let's talk about the market trends that we're seeing sure. as a result of Shrems Two and the global tightening of. The noose around the internet cowboys uh, who played fast and loose with their personal information, treating humans as a product and giving rise to uh, surveillance capitalism. So that's a trigger word. Not for me, for so, somebody. So is the trigger word? <laughs> no, no, no. Surveillance capitalism. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't you learn anything today? <laughs> yes, yes. Today I got in trouble in a in a particular uh Privacy loss alarm. Chatham House rules. Group. Yeah, I'm not going to say it. Just, just cite, saying the words surveillance <laughs> capitalism, it offended someone. Okay. So from a technical standards and specifications perspective, you know, there's been uh, attempts at do not track and now global privacy control to kind of bring some sense of, you know, consumer choice to the web. And do not track as a concept ended up going nowhere since 2012. Do you have thoughts on whether GPC will move the needle on web privacy? And if no, we could just move on to the next question. I, I, I do think it will, from the perspective of this has regulatory backing and force of law in California, which is a big market and, and beyond, and potentially within other state laws and maybe even GDPR. The thing and why I was kind of joking about don't bring don't bring it up is because it is fascinatingly simple and complex at the same time. And I'm, I'm doing a talk on on it uh, with somebody uh, in two weeks, and we put in a couple of proposals to do talk. But in researching the area, I am just kind of amazed at the complexity of the so so i mean just to give you a sample okay so it's a, it's a binary signal from a, a browser and, and it can come either as a web header or as a javascript uh, dom uh, element mm -hmm. and uh that that is essentially supposed to signal do not share my information 
do not sell, do not share, won't get into that whole topic. So from a California perspective, you know, that is a signal that says, hey, sort of company, don't, don't, uh, don't share my data. But uh, the question is, is that if it's coming as a default from the browser, is that a affirmative act on the part of the individual to opt out? And what the California AG said with the Sephora decision is if they have installed a browser like Brave or Abine uh, or a plugin that, that sends a signal, then they have taken an affirmative step to send that. Well, what if it becomes the default in Chrome, you know, to send this and, and everybody is using it? Have they taken an affirmative step or now is it? You know, just uh, by it, virtue it, of being it, a Chrome user. Yeah, yeah, saying, yeah, but 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 now, and this was part of the problem with Do Not Track is is like it was the default in Microsoft Internet Explorer, and and companies were saying, well, that's not an affirmative act on the on the individual's part, so they aren't actually opting out. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the default of the browser, and in the U.S., the the law isn't privacy by default. It's you know it, the user has to take an affirmative act to opt out. So there's a, a fascinating thing there. Then the question is, so if if you do accept it, are you only doing it for like web-based uh, information? Or if you have information like a profile information and you're sharing that with other companies like through a data broker on the back end, does that signal opt out or do they still have to go through your, you know, your web form to opt out? So do right. not sell is a, is a California creation. So if it's in GDPR world, what does this signal mean? Mm -hmm. Is it, is it a, uh, a denial of consent for doing certain things, or is it a opt out of processing? And is it is it opt out of every processing? Or is just it only that, or is it only an opt out of processing for the sharing of data? But you can do other things with it. Uh, again, but only from that web instance. Because what if you then did something different via your mobile on the same page, right? Like, so yeah, is, exactly. it is global privacy control even it, global? It, no, it, it, it's yeah, it's not so across it, all it's of a the very, surface area. It's a very tricky and kind of, you know, showcases the interplay between technology and legal. Mm -hmm. And it's it's very hard for any one side. Now, of course, I mean, my from my perspective, I like to go back to like least common denominator. If you're building in privacy, that this should be an indication. And, and you should be doing privacy by default. Forget the law. You should be doing privacy by default. So even if you're not getting a signal, you shouldn't be sharing data. I mean, nobody's going to love me for this statement, but you shouldn't be sharing data unless people opt in or you have, you know, some legitimate interest in doing so or, you know, whatever. And, and that's a whole nother can of worms that we won't go into. Right. Well, I am glad I asked you about GPC because I honestly, I learned um, a lot and I thought those were a, a great examples as to what, where some of the challenges are. And it's not a panacea for sure. Right. Okay, well, I had so many other questions I was going to ask you, uh, but gosh, I mean, we just could talk for hours and hours. So instead, I'm going to ask you just a general, you know, what trends are you seeing generally that you want to just kind of like, you know, opine about beyond what we've already discussed? And then any advice to the technology, privacy technologists out there that you just want to plug? So general trends, which is, I, I've been like pounding my uh, fist on for a couple of years, is uh, deceptive designs. Right, so-called dark patterns or manipulative designs, and not just about. So the kind of focus from a U.S. law perspective is deceptive designs in collecting consent, uh, but it's any kind of deceptive design where you're trying to manipulate a user, and this is about individual autonomy and manipulating people into making decisions that are not necessarily good for them, but are good for the business. Or decisions uh, they wouldn't have necessarily made right. if not for it, manipulation. Exactly. Right? And this is a clear privacy issue. Again, a lot of people have this kind of misconception of privacy about like confidentiality of data, and they think right. about that. And, and this is this decisional is, interference. This, yeah, it's, it's different. And so, I really want to say to your audience: it's like, look, you need to look at these other sorts of things. In the uh, uh, soul of taxonomy, you have things like uh, surveillance and interrogation that seem on their face about uh, information because uh, you're like gathering information by surveillance or I interrogating uh, people. But the example that I use, you know, we talked about the, the, the surveillance in your room and a camera. What if I put a camera in your room, but it failed to work? But you didn't know it. I mean, it, it's still a violation of your privacy, but it would be my attempt to get it right. and, and the surveillance. Or if it was just, you know, a peephole, 
right? It's it's still a, a violation of somebody's privacy, even though information is not collected. Um, we talk about interrogation. Uh, the example I always use is in a job interview, somebody interviewing a candidate and asking if they're pregnant, right? They may not answer. It's not about information and what I do with the information. Just asking the question is problematic. That asking the question is an invasion of their privacy I and it's going to make their them behavior. and it's going to it's right. going it, it, it's, it's going to create tangible side effects but it also is this kind of moral harm that they shouldn't be doing in the first place so there's all sorts of privacy violations. Don't just think about, you know, confidentiality data or, or personal data. I think that's I, a good one, yeah. I, oh, this is another thing. Going back to the NIST privacy framework, one of the things I have to disabuse people of when I'm teaching about it, like, I won't ask you the question, but I do ask the question of anybody who's kind of involved. It's like, what's important from the NIST privacy framework? Is it personal data, personally identifiable information, personal information? And no matter what they say, they get it wrong. This privacy framework talks about data, Mm. the privacy harms resulting from data processing. It doesn't have to be personal data, personal information. It doesn't have to be unique person. I'll give you an example. This is what I've been using recently. So New York Times published an article about Hasidic Jewish schools in New York. They were collecting taxpayer funding and the schools did some standardized testing on the on the kids. It's like elementary school. And they 100% failed. Like they didn't have basic English and math skills. So New York Times published this. Great. Like it's all aggregated data. It's not saying that, you know, uh, this one person uh, is released. But now you're walking down the street, you run into somebody and you're talking, having a conversation with them. Oh, yes, I went to this Hasidic Jewish school. And now you have a judgment about them because now you now you know that they're in this set of people. Mm. Uh, so this is called uh, in, in academic literature it's called sensitive attribute uh, revelation. So even though I don't know the individual at the time when it was released, I, they've released a sensitive attribute that everybody failed. And so if I run into somebody that is in that set, now I know uh, I can attribute this sensitive category that they failed basic math and English skills to them. And so, again, not about personal data, quote unquote, right. or personally identifiable information, but it's still a privacy harm. So I guess... I'm going to sum it up by going, it's not just about, obviously, it's not just about compliance because, I mean, my whole show is shifting (laughs) privacy left, right? But it also seems to be that you could get a lot of uh, ethics into your organization if you just start threat modeling, just kind of adopting a threat modeling mindset. What could go wrong if I did this? What, not just the happy path of what are we trying to build to, but what could go wrong if we build this? So so one of the analogies I've been using, and forgive me, I don't think we've said this in the last hour, but it's a pollution analogy. Yeah, go for it. So, so back in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, you know, pollution was a problem. Companies were dumping pollutants into the streams and ponds behind their, their uh, manufacturing floor, and it was an externality. So they were imposing a cost on society and individuals outside the company, and they were not internalizing it, but they were getting the profits and returns from the, the chemical processes that they were doing. And then along came government and said, hey, no, if you're going to use arsenic, you have all this paperwork to fill out and you have to handle it in a certain way. And you have to spend money doing compliance and documentation and prove that you (laughs) prove that yeah, insurance and prove that you did all of these things. And, you know, uh, companies were necessarily upset. And it's like, what is this? This is a compliance nightmare. Okay, maybe you need to rebuild your processes. And I think companies are still kind of struggling and maybe coming along. Maybe you need to rebuild your processes so you don't have this industrial pollutant that you're now tasked with being compliant with. So instead of trying to like from a privacy perspective, instead of trying to paper over everything and doing PIAs and DPIAs and data transfer assessments and, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff and, and complaining about how much work it is and papering it is. Rethink your business model and think about how you can achieve your goals without having all of this output that is causing potential problems and causing you problems from a paperwork perspective. I I mean, I, I, I shout about that all the time. I yes. 100% agree. It's like stop the compliance paper chase, which is expensive. Yeah. If you do data minimization or re-architect things oh. or so many privacy enhancing technologies and new architectures that can allow you to like 
prevent having to do some of this. So, so I have a very flippant statement. So a lot of people will say you can't have privacy without security. Sure. Right. Data minimization. If I don't have data, I don't need security. Yeah. At Visa, <laughs> at Visa when I was there, uh, I was um, working in public policy. With VG? With EG. VG. Bob Have? Oh, yeah, yeah. Vibov. Yeah, yeah. Vibov, Back yeah. at that time, he was on the security, uh, yeah, yeah. the security awareness team. And so I was on the public policy team. And one of the big ways that the Visa team would, security team would talk about their security posture was how... They were really focusing on data devaluation. So there was a huge cyber crime department. I mean, mm-hmm. not as big as like Microsoft's, but like, you know, there's a lot of data that Visa can see in terms of cyber criminals, cyber crime, and trying to prevent thefts of, you know, right. banks and stuff like that. And I, I honestly found it fascinating. And with the EMV chip and some of the other innovations, you know, you tokenize data. So you're, you're eliminating any ability to kind of, have a fraud in the transaction right. when a card is present. All the fraud started to move online with the EMV chip because, uh, well, for, I'm yeah, not going to yeah, get yeah. into why. But the fact that that EMV chip was a token and it was tokenized data, we would refer to as our data devaluation strategy because if you make the data worthless to the the criminals, right. then they'll go somewhere else. They go where the money is. Right. And so devaluing <laughs> your data by tokenizing it, by anonymizing it, which is very hard to do, pseudonymizing it, you know, all these different differential privacy, uh, you know, you got to pick the right tool for, from the toolbox for the right use case. But I think that more privacy folks should kind of think in terms of that, you know, how do we make this data so that nobody's going to, you know, want to steal it, copy it, use it in any way other than for which it was intended. Yeah. yeah. And, and- you know, I mean, from my perspective, like for 20 years with data breach legislation and everything, there's been this over focus of on, you know, data security and privacy is about the security of personal data. And as we just discussed, there's all sorts of privacy issues that are not about personal data. Yeah. There's all sorts of things you can do. You know, so, so Solov's taxonomy, which I use, now he has 16 harms. I've actually narrowed it to 15. Won't go into that whole discussion of, of why I think one of them is somewhere else. But one of the things I point out, especially when I'm talking to security professionals, is only one of those 15 harms is insecurity. And that's where the security bucket falls into. But there's 14 other harms that are not about the security of data. It's you know about the use of data or about the sharing of data or about these other things that don't involve data at all. Uh, or ancillarily involved data. And so we've got to start thinking about this much more broader than just the security of data. Well, Jason, thank you we, so much. We can't much. go for another hour? No, not this time. But I'm certain I'll be, you know, speaking with you again on the sure. show. Maybe when there's been like some more like crazy changes in the privacy by design yes. uh, space. Or maybe to bring you back to kind of talk about some snafus in, in recent media. But, you know, thank you so much for joining us today on Shifting Privacy Left to discuss what's new and exciting in privacy by design and default. Well, thank you very much for having me. I believe we have a cocktail reception to head to after this. Yeah, you're also so, keeping me from that. So yeah, that <laughs> right. Now I know your motivation here of getting me yeah. just over with. Yeah. Well, until next Tuesday, everyone, when we'll be back with engaging content and another great guest. Thanks for joining us this week on Shifting Privacy Left. Make sure to visit our website, shiftingprivacyleft.com where you can subscribe to updates so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found this episode valuable, go ahead and share it with a friend. And if you're an engineer who cares passionately about privacy, check out Privato, the developer-friendly privacy platform and sponsor of this show. To learn more, go to privato.ai. Be sure to tune in next Tuesday for a new episode. Bye for now.